So I just want to thank you all for being here to this session on uh, the Central Grassland Social Science Integration Plan. Uh, so if you don't know us already, us so at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, we are a trinational organization working with the governments of Canada, Mexico, and the United States on different topics related to our shared environment. Uh, we have a project on grasslands conservation looking at the central grasslands of North America. And uh, for the past year, two years or so, we've been working uh, with Ashley, Zach, and Ryan and their team at Playa Leishwen Venture. And they've been uh, working on the human dimensions of uh, grasslands conservation on social science. And today, as we are wrapping up our project and closing our work together, we will be hearing from them uh, the result of their final integration plan on uh, integrating social science into grassland conservation efforts. So I'll leave it to them. Uh, we'll hear a presentation of this work at the beginning, followed by a uh, question period and then possibly breakout rooms to discuss uh we are scheduled for an hour and a half so uh, we'll see how it goes uh the chat is open if you have any questions we'll make sure to monitor the chat actually if you can send a quick chat to make sure that it works for everyone that'd be great uh just so i can see that the chat works perfect so if you have any questions, feel free uh, feel free to write in the chat and we'll make sure to to monitor this and uh, I'll leave it to you, Ashley. Thank you. All right. Um, and I'm actually gonna kick us off here. So thank you, Antoine, and thank you all for joining today. Uh, I'm just gonna get started. Um, like Antoine mentioned, this uh, effort is focused on um, the social science of grassland conservation. And uh, what we did was essentially develop an integration plan for, for future work. Um, but first, I would like to just uh, give a little bit of background context here. So as we all know, people rely heavily on grasslands for their livelihoods. And in, re in reverse, grasslands are both managed and shaped by people. And so both these ecosystems, as well as human livelihoods, must be healthy in order for this to be a truly resilient system. Um, most of the central grasslands are privately owned, especially in the U.S. And so understanding human behavior is essential for long lasting conservation that results in a healthy grassland ecosystem. And so despite a lot of current conservation efforts for the uh, central grasslands region, um, grasslands are in, in decline um, on a large scale. And so there has been an uptick in recent social science work to understand the human element of it, which is great. But a lot of that work is not making it into the hands of those working on the ground directly. And additionally, they are often limited in scope, research design, or inference, um, as well as a lot of these efforts are, are duplicates. And um, a lot of the times there's sampling of the same populations. So uh, they tend to not be as coordinated as they could be. And so um, because a lot of the existing efforts have been uncoordinated and lack real world application of their results, uh, research implementation gap is, is often uh, created and, and pretty obvious. And so essentially more coordination and prioritization um, of social science needs is, is essential in order to close that research implementation gap. And so that's where um, this project comes in. Antoine did a great job of, of covering um, the, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. So I won't um, repeat a lot of that, but essentially um, the CEC had put out this RFP to summarize what is known about the social science of grassland conservation across the central grasslands region um, to help inform a future social science research agenda with, with plans of integrating that information into the work of, of various efforts like the Central Grasslands Roadmap for example, um, and other groups that are working on grass and conservation efforts. And so given our role as a joint venture at Bio Lakes Joint Venture um, in coordinating regional efforts, our social science program um, 
in addition to our social science program and connections across the landscape, and the fact that we, we had planned to do this sort of work essentially within the social science program of understanding grassland conservation, um, we thought we were in a really great position to undertake this effort. And so really the goals of this project are to create a starting point for future social science coordination, um, as well as long-term collaboration between social scientists and conservation delivery professionals, and again, really aiming to bridge that research implementation gap um, that, is, that is seen a lot of the time. And this is really needed for social science research priorities to be integrated into conservation delivery, um, as well as future um, social science needs, making their way back to social scientists with the ultimate goal of stopping the loss of grasslands within the region. All right, so just a quick overview of the agenda here. Over the next 40 minutes or so, we're gonna be doing a high level overview of the three different um, components of this project, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and then like Antoine said, we'll have a little bit of time for, for questions about the report. And then to wrap us up, we're actually going to be having a discussion in breakout rooms where we can um, hopefully get all of your perspectives on the gap analysis, as well as opportunities for social science integration. And so the three different project components are the literature review, which I'll be covering momentarily. That was essentially looking at a snapshot of all the gray and peer reviewed literature we could find um, related to social science of grassland conservation, as well as interview data we collected from current social science researchers in the field. The second effort was a, um, a report that summarized uh, a high level summary of three country level producer surveys that were either art that were completed by various other entities previously. And so what we did was summarize those findings in a report. And then lastly, the Delphi needs assessment. Um, essentially, we, we sought to understand conservation challenges, opportunities, social science information needs, and then to prioritize those needs to guide future efforts. And um, the goal is that current and past work can get into the hands of people um, who can then apply it and future projects are usable and useful um, for those working on the ground. So all three of those different components of this project um, essentially summed up to create our integration plan. So a final product that combined all that data and then examined the really big key information and knowledge gaps that were uncovered. Um, okay, so like I said, now I'm going to be covering some highlights of the literature review before um, turning it over to Zach and Ashley. So um, as a first step to bridging that research implementation gap, we had conducted this literature review that's focused on landowner decision-making throughout the central grasslands. And the review really aimed to synthesize existing conservation social science work as it pertains to grassland management. Specifically, we synthesized and interpreted social science research related to grassland management decision-making we identified current social science research and future research needs of social scientists who work in this field. Uh, we, we identified areas within grass and management decision making that have been extensively researched while highlighting knowledge gaps. And lastly, we provided recommendations for future investigation application of our findings to grass and conservation delivery and outreach professionals. And so more specifically in our analysis, we, we primarily focused on identifying the commonly studied grassland management behaviors, understanding the variables that influence grassland conservation behaviors and recognizing the barriers that hinder grassland conservation efforts, which I'll briefly cover in the, in the following slides. Before we dive into the results, I did just wanna share um, a little bit of information about the methods that we employed. So initially we used a search string uh, by Google, Google Scholar to find our first batch of papers for analysis using a process that we adopted from the Center of Environmental Evidence. But then to increase the comprehensiveness of our search, uh, we also solicited literature suggestions from other social scientists, as well as other conservation professionals who work in the central grasslands. And we included those papers if they were deemed relevant. And essentially the papers um, were deemed relevant if they included social science data on grassland stewardship or management within the central grasslands region. So if they included that, we, we, we added them to our analysis. So given that sort of two-pronged approach, we found 104 papers that we deemed appropriate for inclusion. 
These papers primarily consisted of peer reviewed articles, um, which were 88 uh, out of the 104, along with eight technical reports and eight graduate theses. Uh, it's important to note the majority of papers did focus exclusively on case studies within the United States, and then that was followed by Canada, then Mexico, and then lastly, some combination of, of two or more of those countries. Additionally, these studies primarily fell within the realm of social psychology um, and mainly focused on the needs and decisions of white male English speaking cattle producers and ranchers, um, given our, our distribution of papers. Um, and, you know, that is a bias that, that we acknowledge. Um, the research team, Ashley, Zach, and I, we conducted this review um, and, and we work for a U.S. based bird habitat conservation organization. Um, so we, you know, we, we did try to find an adequate amount of papers related to indigenous management, Mexican producers, and to a lesser extent, um, Canadian and non-white producers. Um, we also struggled to find some, some data on, on those demographics. Um, and, and we really, you know, we feel that that, um, that bias or that limitation was due to a scarcity of um, research on a lot of those populations as well as just the availability of that research being in a format um, that's easily accessible, like online. A lot of the times they're in, in physical books um, that were tough for us to get access to. And a lot of indigenous literature is just not in an accessible electronic form um, either. And so we thought it was important to recognize those limitations. We did try to address them in the future needs section of the report. So I really encourage you to, to check out the report um, when it's all finalized for more information there. But also to account for this bias, we explored other ways of understanding grassland stewardship through different lenses, such as indigenous ways of knowing, um, community and participatory approaches, as well as methods from anthropology and sociology that focus on diverse populations. And so that was in addition to the 104 papers we found through the first round. Um, so we had closer to about 150 total for this review. All right, so now getting into the results briefly, relating to the grassland management actions, we found that prescribed burning was the most studied grassland conservation behavior um, out of any, any that we found, and it did seem to be overrepresented in the social science literature. Um, and then papers on burning were followed in frequency by studies that focus on voluntary grassland conservation assistance programs, grazing or haying efforts that support grassland conservation, invasive plant management, and then general rangeland management, such as reducing stocking rates as a conservation practice. Um, it's important to understand these management actions because when we're thinking of promoting different conservation um, efforts, we need to understand the determinants of those actions and, and how successful they may be. And so that brings us to some of the common predictors of conservation behavior related to um, what can drive or predict pro-conservation behaviors. Um, so we found that positive attitudes towards specific grassland um, management behaviors and a sense of moral responsibility to conserve grasslands were associated with increased willingness to engage in conservation activities. And so, for example, ranchers with positive attitudes about fire um, tended to have greater intentions to engage in prescribed burning than those um, with, that didn't harbor that attitude. Um, additionally, personal and social, social norms, along with a positive prior experience, management experience, were found to play a key role in influencing individuals' conservation actions. So, for example, the placement of a conservation easement on one property tended to increase the likelihood of subsequent easements on neighboring lands due to those um, that social norm being created in the community. So those were the most common um, predictors of, of conservation, but on the flip side of that, we also wanted to share highlights on the major constraints to grassland conservation. And so the, the big ones that we found included practical barriers, such as a perceived lack of ability, time, and money to conduct specific conservation behaviors. Um, that was followed pretty closely by concerns related to safety and weather, um, related to pre prescribed burning in particular. Um, as well as the complexity, bureaucracy, and perceived program inflexibility in relation to voluntary grassland conservation assistance programs. So just a couple of our big barriers there. Um, like I said, we also wanted to cover some alternative ways of knowing. And so, you know, we feel that incorporating diverse social science inquiry, such as knowledge gained through participatory or community-based approaches, 
or disciplines like anthropology and sociology, like I mentioned, can enhance communicate conservation strategies by addressing community dynamics and marginalized voices. Additionally, indigenous knowledge systems offer critical insight into sustainable grassland conservation practices, which emphasizes the importance of creating conservation solutions with, with these specific communities. Um, and we also feel that conservation of the central grasslands will rely heavily on engaging with indigenous communities and human populations beyond cattle producers, which was the, the primary demographic, like I mentioned, that we found um, in order to enact lasting conservation um, solutions. So given all of that, we included snapshots of some of these different ways of knowing in the report by creating standalone subsections related to indigenous ways of knowing and other social science disciplines outside of social psychology, like I said. Um, but we particularly feel that the use of indigenous and Western science together can particularly yield more comprehensive information about grassland stewardship and elevate the importance of grasslands to the livelihoods of the human communities um, that live and, and work across the entire region. Uh, like I mentioned, um, we also met with grassland social scientists to understand more about current research being conducted um, within this region. And we found that of those scientists that we had conversations with, the majority of the current projects were related to evaluations of new grassland conservation programs, including payments for ecosystem service um, mechanisms, um, identifying barriers and benefits to conducting specific grassland management practices, um, such as using ranch management plans and, and how that, that relates to conservation, um, determining the perceptions of and factors that predict regenerative grazing, environmental grassland stewardship, and grassland conservation program participation, and lastly, understanding the perceptions of new technologies, such as solar energy, and how these technologies um, might affect grassland management and conservation. So again, just a quick snapshot of some of the current work being done out in the on the ground. And I wanted to end um, the literature review overview by, by just sharing some of the future needs we found through this process. Um, so these included an understanding of the heterogene heterogeneous livelihoods that ranchers hold and how off-ranch income affects grassland management decision-making. There was also, like I mentioned, a resounding need to learn more about and elevate the voices of non-white ranchers and grassland stewards. Um, and it's also important to understand the specific social science research needs of grassland conservation delivery practitioners, number one, and then number two, including those practitioners in social science data collection and analysis to ensure that the data is relevant and easily accessible. And so future research should also collaboratively involve the communities and people who are the research subjects to ensure that the strategies that promote grass and conservation benefit um, do benefit their well-being and livelihoods and promote conservation behaviors that people are actually willing and able to do. All right, so um, that's all I had on literature reviews. So now I'm gonna turn it over to, to Zach to give some highlights on the tri-national survey synthesis. Yeah, so thank you, Ryan, for that. And I will take it from here. And I, I'm going to, again, it, this is going to be a high level overview of some of these um, efforts um, that we were involved with. And so starting it off, and as Ryan mentioned, um, there were a series of tri-national surveys that were done. So there was surveys that were done in each um, respective country by different research teams. Um, that looked to understand um, uh, the perspectives of uh, landowners, ranchers, and producers in the central grasslands region. And so part of this project was to uh, compile that research and try to synthesize what we could with that. And so um, as a as a first step, we sought to understand really how what they how they went about um, gathering that information. Um, and generally, um, across those three surveys, they were uh, consisted of short online surveys. Um, there were a few paper surveys, but by and large, um, short surveys with uh, snowball sampling. So um, using existing networks, they reached out and, and tried to increase the, the sample size um, opportunistically that way. Um, the questions generally were asked in open-ended and, and Likert type questions. So scale, rating scales. And then the programs in general were focused on understanding um, those respondents' perspectives related to programs, 
Um, also, uh, potential metrics and measures to track um, in the central grasslands. And then also um, their perspectives related to communications and messaging needs. And so what we sought to do was to compile all that information and pull out what we could to help inform this, um, this broader research effort or this broader project that we were doing. So next slide. So the results of those, so uh, those surveys, like I mentioned, were conducted by three different research teams and they were um, conducted over about a year and a half or so um, in May, 2021 to October of 22. And they had a decent response rate with the highest responses in Mexico um, and then followed by the US and Canada. Um, however, um, a challenge that we encountered with these surveys were that they um, did not collect or ask the same questions across. And so we um, were unable to ascertain um, what those respondents exactly look like. So we're uncertain about some of the demographics of those respondents um, and also the locations. Um, there was a lack of certainty there, but generally um, found within the central grasslands. And again, these are um, landowners, ranchers, and producers that that um, responded to this report. And so consequently, what we were, we the um, analytical approach we took is to treat these as uh, thematic analyses and just try to pull out some of the real big points that we could. And I'll talk about those now. So in relation to um, programs, uh, we, we uh, coded those responses based upon um, different areas. So in relation to communications, what we we found across those surveys that there was a really, really high uh, preference for in-person events and in workshops. So um, meeting with folks face-to-face -face, um, is uh, important. And then in relation to those characteristics, and again, mirroring what was found in the literature review, um, there's a desire for flexibility in programs, and then also a need for programs to be uh, reflective of um, those local conditions. And so that means both that the social and ecological context of that location, but then also thinking about variability um, across the year and how that may affect what um, they're able to do. Um, in terms of payments, there was a, a real strong expression of this uh, reward idea of rewarding the good. And so thinking about payment for ecosystem services and um, providing payments that reflect positive outcomes, beneficial outcomes that um, stewardship of grasslands provides for, um, for society at large. Um, some of the barriers that were um, identified, and again, are reflecting what was found in the literature review um, related to bureaucracy, so just having to deal with programs, and then also on the administration side, so kind of broadly at the programmatic level, but then also how they're administered down in the, on the ground and how um, it, misadministration can, can cause a barrier for or enrolling and then continuing in programs. And then some of the strategies that were suggested by respondents across the three countries um, related to uh, really wanting um, education and technical assistance. So that was uh, probably one of the most important or common themes that came out. Also resources. So again, tying back to that payment for ecosystem services. And then also, um, more policy support, so um, policies that would be more supportive of um, ranching versus crop production and that kind of thing. So in terms of messaging and, and some of those desires that um, the respondents wanted um, to be expressed on their behalf, um, they really um, wanted to convey that they were experts attached to place. And so they really have this ingrained knowledge found within where they their lands are, and they're attached to that. So they have a real important role within those communities. Um, they're also business people. So they're operating a, a business and, and how they're, they're approaching what they're doing is from that perspective. But also on that other side, they're those stewards of the land. And so they, they really have 
um, see themselves as playing that important role for maintaining um, grasslands. And then finally, related to some of those other patterns that we saw uh, uh, with the um, responses is that desire for self-determination. So they really would like um, to have autonomy and flexibility in relation to um, their decision making and what they pursue on their lands. Next slide. Um, so broadly, what some of the takeaways that we identified from this uh, these three surveys um, was a need for um, coordinated and face-to-face -face communication. So as um, programs and projects are looking to expand their impact, there's a need for um, that coordination, but that has to be um, integrated with work on the ground to have face-to-face -face communications with um, producers. Uh, also, um, in I didn't talk about this earlier, but in relation to some of the suggested metrics, um, some of those that were suggested um, related to some broad scale um, social outcomes. So things like uh, ranch viability, also community impacts and family impacts related to ranching. And so there, there's a need for additional um, social science based information and metrics that can help inform um, uh, both the uh, the ranchers, but then also the public at large. And then probably the largest theme to pull out is that real um, desire for um, rewarding and acknowledging the good that is being done um, by ranchers as stewards in the central grasslands. So that relates to both on the pro program and project side and payment for ecosystem services, but then also in the messaging and, and identifying that and showing that positive role that they're having. So with that, I'll switch to um, the last part of our effort or data collection um, in this project, and that is our conservation delivery needs assessment. And so this uh, project, uh, next slide, uh, was done to really understand um, where some of those information gaps and knowledge gaps are and relating those to the 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 um, perspectives of those conservation um, professionals that are working on the ground. And so um, in order to do that, we used a modified Delphi methodology, um, which seeks to identify consensus among experts about um, a given topic. And in this case, it was trying to understand a little bit more about some of the um, challenges that are facing the grasslands, also social science research topics that would help their work, and then engagement strategies that are most effective for, for their work. And so we did this using an online survey um, that was done over using three rounds of input. And so we iteratively um, worked through a process where at first we um, solicited in, um, information and in open-ended questions. And then subsequent to that, we refined that. So in our round two surveys, um, we sought to start to um, identify agreement and consensus around the importance and effectiveness of a given um, topic. And then in the third round, we refined that further, um, asking for either prior priorities, prioritization, but then also gathering some additional um, feedback and comments about what our findings were found. And so um, as a part of this process, we used a consensus uh, criteria of 70% or above of uh, folks uh, indicating very or extremely on a five point Likert scale. Next slide. And so uh, the results of this study are actually really exciting, I think, in, in that we had a, a lot of really interesting insights that came from this, and we had a, a lot of um, interest in this effort in general, which uh, Ashley will talk about more later. Um, so in the first round, we were able to get uh, 78 responses, um, and we some of those, it fell out through the subsequent rounds, but we still maintained a high response rate. So and at the end of the third round, we had 
um, 34 responses, but again, that was uh, pretty good. And it, importantly, we were able to um, receive responses from every state, province, and country um, across the central grasslands. And so again, as with the um, literature review, we found that the majority of those responses were in the US and then in descending order, we had responses from Mexico, Canada, and then indigenous nations were last with six resp responses. In relation to um, the area, uh, we asked folks the area where they worked or how large of an area they were responsible for. And most indicated that they were um, responsible for a portion of a state or province. Um, and followed by folks that were working at an entire state level. So again, people working at a, a fairly um, local scale. Um, in terms of the organizations that were represented, um, by and large, most were in that, or the vast majority, I would say, were either in an NGO or a state or provincial agency. And so if you look at that, we're almost to three quarters of respondents were in those two groups. And then in career stage, we also asked just to get a better understanding of what we were looking at there. And uh, most were either early um, to mid career. And again, um, that would be expected as we were focusing on those, those conservation uh, professionals. Uh, next slide. So uh, for our, um, so what I, so, we broke this out into those different um, areas that we will then talk about separately. And I'll, I'll just talk about the first one, um, which is the, the research topics. And then Ashley will talk about some of the land or the engagement strategies and other insights from the Delphi. And so for the research topics, uh, what we decided to do as we were um, receiving uh, such a, a large response is to use um, a conservation decision-making framework from the literature to help organize some of our coding. And so we used this framework to break out the different categories that then we would um, ask subsequent um, questions about. And so um, each one of those colored blocks represents one of the, the main categories for um, coding of those research topics. And we felt like this was a, a way to tie in with existing literature, but also allowed for a better understanding of some of the um, disciplinary um, social science disciplines that would be represented in um, subsequent research topics. Next slide. So uh, the first box there that we, that we uh, covered was the social ecological context. And this was by and large the the where most of the responses were the items that we identified were. Um, so after that um, consensus process, after uh, the the two rounds, we had a total of twenty six uh, items that were maintained in our uh, research topics. And looking at those in subcategories of that broader social e ecological context box. Uh, we uh, had macro and micro structures. And so these were um, topics that um, were identified with really trying to understand that difference between or the impact of um, different incentive subsidies um, and insurance on um, the potential for um, grassland conservation. So as it related to impacts on how the economics of production would vary and and impact um, conservation. And then also related to this was at that more micro scale, there were questions that related to um, ways in which um, conservation practitioners or professionals could um, relate to landowners. So how best to develop those relationships with landowners and um, what form of communication do, do landowners um, want? Next slide. So continuing on with that, there were um, two other subcategories in this broader category. 
and those related to um, characteristics of the individuals in practice. And so in this category, we saw that there were a lot of research topics related to under getting a better understanding of landowners' values and motivations and how those related to um, how they valued um, grasslands and their, their goals related to those grasslands. Um, we also found um, that there were questions just broadly about ways to achieve behavior change and the role that economics played. And that was a, another common theme that we identified is there's a lot of questions about co comparisons between economics and other um, factors that could be at play in decision-making. And then finally, um, again, uh, interest in understanding more some of the barriers of adopting practices um, such as controlling woody plants, prescribed fire, and um, grazing plans. And again, relating that or what are the relative economics of those um, practices. Next slide. Um, so that next category was related to consequences and outcomes. And so here we had a total of nine research topics that that were agreed upon by our panel of experts. And these uh, related to um, identifying the costs and benefits of practices. So uh, prescribed fire, grassland con conversion, and um, production on native grasslands. And then also identifying um, information or quantifying information that would help to translate the outcomes of conservation for um, the general public which ultimately the goal was to um, increase understanding and in the, the way that the general public is valuing grasslands. And then the final category for which we had um, topics select selected was in relation to belief formation and the decision-making contest, con decision-making process. And this was a total of eight um, topics. And so we broke these out in related to information and communication needs, and then understanding um, how landowners arrive at those decisions. And so in that communi communication needs area, um, there was, again, that, that need or wanting to get a better understanding of how to get the general public to value grasslands and also for landowners to value grasslands. So what information and how to communicate that. And then again, on that, evaluating the, eff the effectiveness of those communication materials. In relation to um, the decision-making process, it was trying to, they, there, was, there were questions that were related to understanding um, how um, landowners or producers are weighing different options. And then a, a, a few questions that really were important related to are rated as important related to the persistence of conservation behaviors after programs end. So, and then there was, if you remember back to that diagram, there was one um, category for which no, uh, no categories were selected or topics were selected and that was that aggregated or group behavior. And so um, through the process, none of those were rated as being important for um, informing work. So those were pulled out. And so uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Ashley so she can talk a little bit more about the effective landowner um, engagement strategies. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Um, so yeah, we asked um, in the first round for um, respondents to list effective strategies for landowner and community engagement separately that would encourage uh, grassland conservation stewardship where you work in the central grasslands regions. And so of all of the strategies that were listed, we um, thematically analyzed them in category, into categories similar to how Zach did with the research questions. And we received um, consensus, and again, that's 70% of respondents that rated different categories as very or extremely effective. So we had consensus on three categories of landowner ex engagement strategies. And so these categories were targeted conservation delivery professional strategies. So these were strategies that related to um, various aspects of conservation delivery professionals and the, the work that they do. 
The second consensus category was landowner led or peer to peer strategies of um, grassland stewards or landowners um, basically talking to other landowners about um, and leading different efforts. And then the third category of consensus was using financial incentives to incentivize these grassland conservation behaviors. So next, we asked about specific strategies within the consensus categories. And so within the targeted conservation delivery professional strategies category, um, we had quite a few specific specific strategies that re received consensus on effectiveness, nine to be exact. However, instead of telling you all nine, I just picked the top 3%. And these top three on the left-hand side um, all received 97% of people saying that they were very or extremely effective. And that's listening to producers' needs and understanding how to make connections between conservation practices and landowner management objectives. The second one was forming strong and long-term relationships with landowners or land stewards. And the third was one-on-one -on -one in-person communication between practitioners and landowners. And this one should be um, a repeat for you because it was also important on the flip side in those three country surveys. So we also asked our respondents to, to tell us some 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 things about the barriers to actually enacting some of these effective strategies. And so for these specific strategies, um, respondents mentioned a lack of staff time and capacity to get these, um, to enact these strategies, lack of proper staff training and support to actually get these things on the ground, and having difficulty finding the right people to fill these roles and to retain those conservation delivery staff. Again, that was a resounding um, issue that was faced. Also, another thing that was brought up is that a lot of times conservation delivery staff evaluation is focused a lot on, on an annual basis on acres on the ground and not trust building that might take years. So again, a lot of these strategies have to do with trust, but the evaluation for these conservation delivery folks is more focused on acres in the short term rather than acres in the long term through trust building. Next slide. So next on the landowner led and peer to peer strategy category, we had two specific strategies that received consensus. And that was peer to peer groups where producers can actually see the benefits of grassland management behaviors from other producers. And then encouraging landowners to tell other landowners about the benefits they've experienced by doing these conservation behaviors from word of mouth. And so the barriers that were brought up to, to enacting some of these strategies includes that the landowners and managers that might be able to do this are too busy often to lead these groups or they don't, or they're not able to attend. Um, also, they mentioned it was difficult to find the right people within the community to be champions. Again, these conservation delivery professionals are worried about acres on the ground, and sometimes it's hard for them to kind of take a step back and figure out who might be the right people to lead these groups. And also, it was mentioned that it's difficult to reach a large number of people at, at set events. Oftentimes, a lot of the people that are in the room or at the events are actually conservation staff rather than um, land stewards, or when there are land stewards, a lot of them are the ones that are already doing the actions, not people that might be open to them. Next slide. And then finally, in the financial, using financial incentives category, we had two consensus strategies um, with providing landowner um, cost share opportunities for grazing infrastructure and payment for grassland conservation actions as well as keeping reimbursement for conservation practices simple. Again, this was something that was also mentioned by the producers themselves in the three country surveys. And so barriers to some of these financial incentive strategies is that a lot of times, you know, incentives are too low um, for to even allow ranchers to continue to, to, to continue ranching and to make any men's meat. So even with these incentives, they might not be big enough to allow people to stay in ranching. And then also it was mentioned that incentives often do not lead to persistence after the incentives end or support an environmental ethic, which is really needed to kind of think about grassland conservation on the long term. Next slide. So basically what we found is that even though financial incentives were important in a consensus category, there was really complex attitudes about these incentives. On the one hand, people thought that they were important, but on the other hand, people said that using incentives sometimes didn't lead to persistence in or change. So I wanted to talk about some of the, so we, we asked people to talk a little bit about this complexity in the third survey, which is kind of cool 
the cool thing about the Delphi, you can actually ask people to talk a little bit more about what we found in earlier surveys. So Ryan, next slide. First, here are the comments that were brought up on the kind of pro side of financial incentives. So people said that ranchers must be able to financially support themselves. Um, and so these incentives would help get them over the edge to allow them to stay in ranching. And then also people mentioned that these incentives basically would help people work towards long-term profitability and sustainability. So finances are important for this long-term profitability of ranching rather than payments in the moment. And again, there was this, this thought about you must shifting the mindset to think about ranching and ecosystem services across generations, rather than looking at your land and thinking about how much money it's going to make, thinking about all the ecosystem services it's providing for your family generationally over the generations and also for your community and the biome. And so this financial help um, would be needed long term, they said, to shift this mindset, some people said. Next slide. So kind of on the flip side, um, some people said that, you know, these financial incentives are unfeasible long term, but they help to start this conversation in the conservation conversation. So, um, again, we must shift our mindset to think about across generations that was also brought up. But it's, again, difficult to guarantee the long term funding. And again, money is not the best way to create that lasting ethic. So another thing that was brought up on the flip side was that the incentive structure really needs to be reformed on who receives the money, how much money they receive, et cetera. Next slide. So we also asked about effective community engagement strategies. However, we received no consensus categories on that. So in the third survey, instead of asking about those specific strategies, we asked about why people thought that there was no consensus on the um, categories of strategies. And so people basically mentioned that it was hard to, to find consensus on effective strategies because no one category or strategy will work for every community. And that this work must begin at the individual level to be able to, to reach the community in general as well. And then other people also mentioned that community engagement is actually very complex and difficult and that many conservation delivery practitioners are more set up to work at the individual level and on a one-on-one -on -one basis and might not have the training to really be like community organizers, which is kind of what is needed in these strategies. Next slide. So with the short amount of time that we have, I want to talk, I want to kind of bring this all together and discuss the social science gaps, priorities, and some opportunities for integration. Next slide. So first, what are the information gaps? So there, there were a lot of, there was a lot of needs requested from the Delphi about information about specific conservation practices. However, in the literature review, we found quite a lot of information about practices such as prescribed burning and enrolling in conservation programs. Those had a plethora of social science information available. So this represents information gap that might not, this information might not be getting down to the ground, although this, this knowledge actually exists. So there's some sort of communication gap. They also, in the Delphi, go back, sorry. They also asked for information about specific barriers and to and predictors of grassland conservation behaviors, um, both in general and associated with specific practices. And this was also, um, we also found quite a lot of literature on um, barriers to and predictors to grassland conservation efforts, again, indicating that we're not doing a great job or there's some sort of gap between the information that exists and the information that needs to be integrated on the ground. Next slide. So next I wanna talk about these knowledge gaps. So these are gaps in knowledge where we, we don't have the knowledge, but these are information. this is information that has been shown to be needed by both social scientists and grassland conservation delivery professionals. So what we saw is that a lot of research um, 
includes one scale of analysis. So either the individual or the community. And we lack research that bridges multiple scales of analysis, yet we're often asked to scale up these individual efforts to the community, the regional, and the biome level. Also, there were some specific management behaviors that were not covered as much in the literature, and that includes things such as chemical and mechanical treatments for non-native plants, mulching, and mixed species herbivory to reduce invasive woody plants. There was also little knowledge about emerging and innovation man innovative management approaches, such as the development of industries um, that incentivize grassland conservation, um, and unique approaches to land management that can help alleviate some of the economic constraints related to conservation. Again, we also found uh, a lack of information about grassland perceptions of populations outside of ranchers, yet people in the Delphi really wanted to know how the public and different members outside of the agricultural community thought about grassland conservation issues to help um, create grassland value systems. Next slide. So through all of these three um, approaches, we also kind of were able to think about some future social science research priorities. And so it seems like we really need to think about more information related to mac macro structures. So what's happening at the program in incentive programmatic and policy level and how those, those big picture efforts then have implications for grassland conservation. We need to have more communications about how these programs translate into outcomes. And then how do the um, current incentive and subsidy programs work against or for conservation? Another big research priority that kind of came to light was looking at examining more of the social and ecological context of, of decision making. And as Zach mentioned, really looking at the relative role of economics in motivating this grassland conservation versus other variables. Again, most of the studies focus on individual types of variables and don't look kind of across these economics versus other variables and what and how the weighting of each varies. Next. So last, I wanted to talk about some opportunities for integration, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. So we found both knowledge and information gaps. And so we really need to kind of bridge these gaps. We really need to create opportunities for interaction and coordination between social science and conservation delivery professionals. So we need to continue to summarize, translate, and communicate about these existing the existing research that um, professionals on the ground are requesting. And then we also need to support integration of current research into conservation delivery professional training and the work that they're doing on the ground. Next slide. And so on the flip side, we also see a lot of benefit from integrating social science expertise into conservation delivery itself. That can help to improve conservation delivery programs and staff recruitment and retention and understand what factors lead to that and lead to success of recruitment and retention of, of staff. We also need to look at improving relationship. This can also help to improve relationships between conservation delivery professionals and um, grassland stewards on the ground. And we also could use this expertise to help learn about populations who rely on grasslands, but previously have been underserved by conservation. Next slide. So last, I just wanted to say some of the inherent challenges of doing this whole big project. And so, as you know, this was a tri-national effort and there are different policy and cultural landscapes within each country and within regions and communities. And again, we've heard that things must focus on the individual and community level, yet we're asked to kind of scale up and um, do have a larger return on investment so we can coordinate our efforts across the biome. Again, it's been, we found a lot of difficulty scaling from the individual to the biome scale. So we'll need to kind of resolve that in the future, all of us. 
And then also there's a really, really big challenge to think about how can professionals protect time and effort, professionals and social scientists protect time and effort to coordinate and collaborate on these efforts. Next slide. So before we go to questions, I just wanted to thank everybody who filled out the Delphi survey and who we and we had interviews with, one-on-one -on -one conversations with various social scientists, biological scientists, grassland conservation delivery practitioners who came to any of the meetings that we had, who came to any of our previous presentations. I wanted to give a huge thank you. This project would not have been possible without all of you, many of whom are on this call. So with that, I wanted to give we don't have a lot of time for overall questions, but some time for some overall questions. And then we're going to transition into breakout groups to talk about some of these things. Thank you.